name is. Aren't you glad you know what his name is? Let's give the Lord one more hand clap of praise tonight. Hallelujah. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I will keep my preliminary remarks brief and let you be seated. I want to say what a great privilege it is to be in PSR this year. Some of the finest preaching, straightest preaching my ears have ever heard have come across this pulpit this week, and I am so deeply grateful for it. In fact, someone said that others have been reading their notes they haven't just read mine they've stomped on them tore them apart put them back together and so I really felt like just coming up here tonight and saying ditto about 12 times and sitting down praise the Lord but um, I want to thank these men for the gracious invitation uh, to come and preach again this year it's one of the great honors of my life I would like to say or do something tonight that would be a blessing to somebody. If you will turn in your Bibles to the book of Psalms chapter 50. Psalms chapter 50. Thank you again uh, to each of the men that have preceded me for the uh, clear and certain sound that we have heard this week. Amen. And uh, it's good to see this great throng of people ready to have church worship the Lord and that love the preaching of the Word of God I don't feel worthy to be up here whether the message I have tonight is appropriate or not whether it fits doesn't fit whether it's negative or positive I don't know you'll have to decide that after a while but I can say this without any hesitation it is the passionate burden of my heart tonight Psalms chapter 50 reading one verse of scripture verse number two the Bible says out of Zion the perfection of beauty God hath shined could you read that together with me tonight out of Zion the perfection of beauty God hath shined would simply like to speak to you tonight for a little while this very very simple subject you can't improve on perfection you can't improve on perfection God bless you you may be seated tonight Zion of course was the name given to the formidable fortress of rock which David looked at one day and desired greatly so much so that he promised that whoever would take that high place from the then inhabitants the Jebusites would become the captain of all his men Joab rose to the challenge and because of that very great accomplishment was indeed the great general of David from that point forward after it came into his possession the name Mount Zion became actually applied to not just the one high spot the uh, Mount of Rock the fortress of Rock but it came to be applied to the entire city of Jerusalem uh, the name Zion means a conspicuous place. The literal meaning is a permanent capital. It was the location that David chose for his palace, and later Solomon would build his temple there. So that uh, it became the spot where it was the center of, of government, and power and authority not only in a political or national sense but because of the presence of the temple there it became also the center 
of all spiritual observance as far as the Israelites were concerned. Historically, it became the most important and significant spot in all of the nation of Israel. It has prophetic significance as well. Promises are made concerning Zion as the location for the future place of government when Christ comes back to this world and establishes his kingdom during the millennial reign. Spiritually, references throughout Scripture are made to Zion as the city of truth, the holy hill, and the city of righteousness. It is no doubt because of the overall aura and respect for this place that David was moved upon to say one time, beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. This central position as a repository of truth and together with the divine attention that God placed upon it throughout the centuries of time gives this location, Zion, a symbolic representation of the modern-day church today. In fact, the Bible has this to say in the 12th chapter of Hebrews. You are not come unto the mount that might be touched, and that burn with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words which voice they that heard entreated, that the word should not be spoken to them any more. But you are come to Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than of Abel. I just want to remind you tonight of what God put you in when he put you in the church. He put you in a very unique institution that is unlike any other in all of the world today. Amen. When you came into Mount Zion, when you came into the church, God placed you upon, amen, the place called the pillar and the ground of truth. This is literally the center of all human activity. It is the center of the entire universe. It is the focus of all spiritual and spirit world interest. Amen. This is the arena, amen, where God performs. This is the stage on which he acts. This is the battleground in which he fights. This is the seat of all human and divine government. This is the apex of all human experience. I'm telling you, there is no greater place in all the world than the church of the living God. Amen. I've been to some of the finest, amen, sightseeing attractions in the world, but I can tell you that none of them do for me. Amen. What stepping into the house of God does. I've been in the Grand Canyon. I've been over the Amazon jungle. I've been in the Painted Desert. I've been on the Golden Gate. I've been at the Gateway Arch. I've been on top of the Sears Tower. I've been on the Empire State Building. I've been in the bayous of Louisiana. And I'm telling you, there is no greater place in all the world than the Church of the Living God. This is Bethel, the house of God, literally the gateway to heaven. This is the launching pad from earth to glory. 
This is where heaven comes down and glory fills our soul. This is where the temporal and the eternal collide. This is where the earthly and the heavenly come into contact. This is where the human and the divine come as one. Oh, I want God to kiss this place one more time tonight. Aren't you glad that God put you in Mount Zion tonight? Praise the Lord. In fact, I want the world to know this evening that the last defense against the abortion problem is not at the picket lines in front of the abortion clinics. The last defense against abortion is in the church tonight. The last defense against homosexuality is not in some classroom or in some institution. It is in the church. Amen. In a place where you can hear preaching like you've heard here this week. Preaching that will teach you how to be a man if you're a man and a woman if you're a woman. To dress like one and act like one. Oh my God. The last defense against a broken home is not in the divorce courts of America. It is in an old fashion altar of repentance. Amen. The last defense against the moral turpitude and the depravity of our society. Amen. Is not somewhere out there. It's not in a rehab center. It is right here on Mount Zion in the church of the living God. The last defense against crime. The last defense against violence. The last defense against all the horrible things that are done in mankind is at an old-fashioned prayer meeting and church service and revival meeting on Mount Zion. Look what it has done to you. Some of you are cigarette suckers, beer guzzlers, whiskey sippers, amen, dope poppers, pill poppers, amen, all kinds of other things. But here you are tonight, washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, filled with the Spirit, and on your way to heaven. Oh, what a difference Mount Zion has made in our lives. Amen. The church is the last refuge for broken homes. The church is the last refuge for shattered dreams, for failed hopes, amen, and for ruined lives. The church is the last hope for exhausted souls, for disillusioned minds, and for empty spirits. Amen. I'm not sorry that I'm in the church. Don't feel sorry for me. I'm not a second-class citizen. I am a citizen of the city of God. Amen. The place where God reigns. I want you to know the church is his place of divine authority and reign and rule. Amen. The dominion, amen, of Bill Clinton and Hillary stops when you walk in the doors of an apostolic church. Amen. The authority of your governor and of your city official stops when you come through the doors of an apostolic church. It might be all right to be a homosexual in the military, but it ain't all right in here. Thank God. There is still a refuge. God is known in her palaces for a refuge. Amen. This is the best God has. It flowed right out of his side. Amen. This is a little heaven to go to heaven in. Oh, I'm so glad I'm in the church. If you are, give the Lord another hand clap of praise tonight. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You can be seated. In fact, I'll just tell you that what, amen, a lot of the world is just now discovering. We've known a whole long time in the church. Sociologists are just now being able with all of their studies. Amen. They are tracing the cause of most of our social maladies. Amen. To the breakdown of the home and the family. Well, amen. It's about time they woke up. You heard it a long time ago. In the church. 
Amen. This big promise keepers movement that has swept our nation. Amen. They're just now trying to come around and renew their vows to their wives and their commitment to their families. Amen. To their jobs, to their to their society, to their community, and to their fellow man. Amen. I'm telling you, they came along real, real late. We've been preaching that a long time right here in the church. Amen. Philosophers are just now beginning to admit, amen, in all of their quest for meaning and self-worth, that there must be a higher power somewhere. You heard that first in the church. Amen. Praise God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Those that are into metaphysics are saying that all matter comes as a result. Amen. Of a high intelligence somewhere. I read that first in John 1 and 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Amen. And, the, and the, everything that was made was made by the word of his power and the Bible goes on to say in him was life and that life was the light of men oh I feel like preaching a little while here tonight praise God amen politicians are finally getting courageous enough to stand up in front of crowds and say and admit, amen, that uh, television is the leading cause of violence and promiscuity among the young people of America. You heard that first in a church. I want you to know these men are not stuck in some backwater. They are on the very leading edge of society today. What Hollywood is all the time, amen, trying to recreate and imitate and duplicate, amen, because they know we are on to something. And so the devil tries to come up with a cheap substitute, amen. We've had it all along in the church. We got the real thing, honey, amen, and the duplicate won't do. A few years ago, they came out with some film about a strange little wrinkled up creature with great big eyes that came from somewhere out of space, landed on this earth, befriended some young children, was misunderstood by society, was ultimately killed, but then he resurrected himself, came back to life, went away, and the slogan of America, amen, for a long time was E.T. Call Home. I've got one better than that. I can tell you about a God that robed himself in flesh, was born in a manger in Bethlehem, came and dwelt among us, felt our pain and sorrow, befriended a few little uh, simple folk, a tax collector and some fishermen. He was misunderstood by society. He was executed, crucified on a tree. But on the third day, he rose again and he ascended up on high and he left us a promise saying I'm coming back my cry tonight is even so come quickly Lord Jesus I can tell you even more than that amen he is right here in this room tonight because before he went away he said I'm leaving but I'm sending you the promise of my father amen and I'm here to tell you amen he can deliver you from whatever binds you he can forgive you of whatever sin you've committed he can wash your black heart and make it white he can fill you with the Holy Ghost he can heal your sickness he can make you over again right here tonight come on praise him praise him praise him praise him Woo! hallelujah praise God amen you can be seated I'm here to tell you when when God is shining out of Zion there is no greater beauty. There is no greater radiance. 
There is no greater brilliance than that. There is nothing that can come close, amen, to the experience, the feeling, the sight, the sound, you name it, of what takes place when God is shining out of Zion. What concerns me tonight is that we have, amen, a generation, not all of them, thank God, but some of them, of intellectuals, entrepreneurs, amen, and intellects and sophisticates that are coming along in this late hour, amen, and they are wanting to redesign the church. They are ashamed of some of the very things that are the secrets of her attraction. Well, come on now. Amen. They're embarrassed. They're trying to modify, change, reorganize, amen, reinstitute. Oh, they're so smart. They're so intellectual. But my Bible tells me tonight, walk about Zion. Go round about her. Tell the towers thereof. Mark you well her bulwarks. Consider her palaces that you may tell it to the generation following. I am here tonight with a message, amen, to add to all the others, to Generation X tonight. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. You can't improve on perfection, honey. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God hath shined. Amen. All right. You can be seated. Lest you think I'm just posturing up here. Amen. I'm just trying to um, earn some brownie points. Amen. Let me just tell you something. I grew up on the mission field. Amen. I grew up, amen, out there on the cutting edge. Amen. In South America, I am the old timer. I got the Holy Ghost two years after my father received the revelation of Jesus' name, baptism, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. I grew up going to church and ramshackle little buildings put together with pieces of wood and corrugated metal. I knew what it was to go to church in buildings with earthen floors, splintery benches, and crude instruments. But I'm going to tell you something. Something got a hold of me. It was not the size and the beauty of the building. It was not the fashion and the clothes that was hanging on the people because it was barely adequate at best. It was not the music because all we had most nights was a few tambourines, a box guitar, and maybe an accordion. Amen. But I'll tell you what got a hold of me as a young boy. It was the spirit of mighty God that I could feel when I went to church. It was that spirit that kept us sitting there, amen, on frigid cold nights and when there wasn't any heating and the wind was whistling through the building and we were shivering to our bone but happy to worship God. It was that that kept us sitting there in sweltering, smothering heat, amen, and oblivious to the sweat pouring down our faces, amen, happy to be in church. I want to remind this congregation tonight the attraction that we have to the world it's not our buildings it's not our clothes it's not our music it's not our talent it is the presence of almighty God I know what David's talking about when he says one thing have I desired from the Lord and that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Somebody shout hallelujah. 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 Praise God. You can be seated. I'm trying to hurry. I don't operate well within these constraints. Don't do very well as it is. Amen. But I'm trying. Praise God. I am concerned tonight. I'm not, I'm not worried about the church, understand? The church is going to be all right. The church is going up. What I'm worried about is whether we're in it or not. Oh, hallelujah. 
amen, we can sit here and pat ourselves on the back and say we've got all our ducks lined up. But there is a move sweeping across this country that unless we keep an eye on it, it will overrun us as well. Let me just try to speak to you very quickly about three little areas of my concern. Number one is worship. Amen. Uh, uh, there are some that are coming along today. There are, they are so high on performance and perfectionism and having a program. They have programmed God right out of the church. They are ashamed and offended by old time worship. They don't want anybody getting excited. They don't want anybody slinging bobby pins. They don't want anybody running the aisles. Don't want anybody rolling on the floor. Hey, Amen. Praise God. If, if you like it that way, you can go ahead and have your dead dry services. But I like to feel something when I come to church. Hallelujah, hallelujah, praise God. Then there are those that want to control every single item and every single aspect of the service. Amen, we can't go overboard here and overboard there because we got to move along. I'm not talking about a meeting like this. There's a lot going on in a meeting like this. I'm talking about in the local church. Amen. Sometimes the announcements takes longer than the preaching of the Word of God. We can stop a service cold to make sure a synthesizer is hooked up. Oh, my God, where have we gone wrong? I'll tell you what we need. We just need to get hooked up to the Spirit of God. Uh, I'm here to tell you, you can't improve on perfection. I've heard of some churches that are hiring choreographers to come in and teach their people how to dance so that when visitors come, they're not offended. Amen. Some are even having ballet teams. Wouldn't your preacher look cute? Amen. Prancing across the platform in a pair of leotards. Woohoo! Hey, honey. If noise bothers you, if exuberance bothers you, you are shown up in the wrong place. Because the book said, oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto the Lord for the voice of triumph. Amen. I'm going to tell you something. We, uh, not only is God worthy of it, you can be seated. Not only is God worthy of it, amen, but we derive a special benefit from this. Do you know that worship is therapeutic? Uh, you know, I heard something the other day, amen, and this was that there is a drug called interleukin-2. Amen. It is an anti-cancer drug. Amen. When they market it and produce it, it is uh, somewhat effective in fighting carcinogens in your body. Amen. If you get cancer and you get a treatment of interleukin-2, it may cost you over $40,000 for a round of treatment. It is very expensive and hard to produce. And yet, do you know that your body produces it naturally? But only when it has a joy experience. In one joyful experience, your body can produce the equivalent of one million dollars worth of interleukin-2. Hallelujah! I'm telling you, it pays to worship God. It pays to get excited. Woo! Hallelujah! The Bible said, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye people. The Bible says, leap for joy. Some of you stiff starchy folks, you might start feeling better if you just do a little leaping for joy. I don't know about you, but I get joy when I think about 
what he's done for me. I get happy when I think about what he's done for me. You're not going to make us nervous, honey. I mean, you stumbled into an apostolic church. This is a tongue talking, hand clapping, foot stomping, aisle running. Amen, church of the living God. I am convinced that the secret of having a move of God, I mean, you want to you know the secret of revival? I can give it to you. Amen. Throw away all your books and all of your programs and just go to church and have church. We don't need to borrow the rock and roll. Ready? young people are coming off a three-day fast. You may not hear it and they're singing, though I hear it. I can feel it in their singing. Brother Bruce Howe, come up and praise the Lord real quick from El Salvador. We love to have Brother Howe here. Jump up here. Hey. It's great to be in the house of the Lord and feel the presence of God. Hallelujah. There's nothing like feeling his presence and know that God's spirit is moving all over the world. Can you say praise the Lord? I called back to El Salvador just a couple of days ago and one of our pastor's fathers who we have prayed for for eight, 18 years since I had pastored the church there. My wife informed me we baptized him in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ on Sunday. Hallelujah. I want you to know the world is ours in Jesus' name. We don't need to bow our head in shame, but we need to raise our head in thankfulness to God. Hallelujah. And claim this world for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Brother Taclamarian, come here. You've got two minutes now. I can't let you preach tonight, but get up here. This man, this church loves Brother Taclamarian. Ah, I am not a young man. I'm 61, I think, about. But I feel the spirit of the Lord. Just maybe two or I don't know how many months or two months, I think, before 3,000 Muslim brothers reported to us to come and baptize them in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And... And my wife sent me, when I arrived here to America, my wife uh, faxed to us that a person uh, around four, how many? 400 people out of 290 churches, the, leader, the leaders all baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and they are going to bring the 290 churches to our unity, to our to you, PC. Not only that, 15 uh, uh, leader of 15 churches were baptized in our conference in December, and his people are ready to come and be baptized in the name of Jesus. 15 churches. Therefore, to get all together, the 3,000 Muslim and the 290 uh, other churches, Protestant, uh, Pentecostal, Protestant, Trinitarian churches, and the 15 other. Trinitarian churches all together are coming to the I 
think somebody ought to praise the Lord with that kind of revival. I said, get a hold of Brother Lehman. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Maybe see, it's a privilege to have our foreign mission director with us tonight, and he's the one that had the vision of all this happening, and uh, he's the one that helped bring it all to pass. It would have never happened without Brother Sism and his department. I support him 100%. I want to thank Brother Sism for his love and for the trust that he put in this church. And Brother, I think we have finally pulled it off. It was rough up there, and it's been rough down here, but we made it. It was your dream. And you made it our dream, and we've made it. Would you welcome Brother Sism to the pulpit to greet us? Praise the Lord. <laughs> While you brethren are here, you're going to hear many wonderful things, but you're going to feel many wonderful things also. And I know that you're going to leave here better prepared for the work of the kingdom. Thanks to Pastor Mangan and his father, Brother G.A. Mangan, and all the staff here for opening the door, inviting us to come and be here. Thanks to Brother Ten in the Louisiana District for all they have done to make this possible. And I feel that God is going to do something very special in our hearts that when we leave here, we're going to have a sense of urgency greater than we've ever had, and we're going to take the kingdom by force, with violence, until we see great and mighty things accomplished for his kingdom. Well, Brother Patterson, to come to the platform, understand our executive president from the Southeast region is here for the general board. We're, there he is. Come on up here, brother. We're glad you're here. We're very glad to have home with us tonight. District Superintendent from South Carolina. We prayed him through in this church. My dad baptized him in the Jesus name, and he's now District Superintendent of the South Carolina District. Welcome, brother and sister Clayton. We're so very glad. Hey, it's great to be home tonight. I was thinking we came by this afternoon, or this morning, came by the church, and went to the Family Life Center, and went by what a building. 
told someone, I said, I really like this. I said, the only thing, I wished it was mine, and he had one bigger. But it is great to be home. We came by, went to the prayer room, and I concur with Brother Sizzle. You walk into these buildings, you feel the very presence of God. It was that presence of God that I, I felt some 36 years ago when I, I made my way into the building down at 16th and Day Street. There God filled me with the Holy Ghost. It has been great. Met a young man back here tonight, and I think they said he had had the Holy Ghost about a week and a half. And I, I kind of patted him on the shoulder, and I said, well, I said, it's great. I've had it a little over 36 years, and it just gets better as you go along. I do appreciate Brother and Sister Mangan very, very much for the foundation they laid in our life and the support they've given us through the years, and then uh, Brother and Sister Anthony Mangan coming along and just carrying things to greater heights and deeper depths. It's great to be a part of the family of God. Amen. Good to see Brother Sism tonight and all of our friends from the Foreign Missions Division. And good to see Brother Howell tonight. We haven't seen him some time, but uh, love and appreciate this man. I better stop there. Great to be with you. God bless you. Briar from Burma, would you come up here, please? We want to hear from you. Would all of our regional uh, missionaries stand, please? We're very glad to have you with us tonight. I'm not going to name you all. Stand, our regional men. Yes, stand. Thank you. Thank you. These are our men that are over all of our foreign missionaries in their region. We're very glad to have our regional supervisors with us tonight. In 1992, my wife and I had the privilege to attend a solid conference. On our way back to Texas and Arkansas, we stopped here for a few minutes. And my wife and I entered into this place, walking around and look at activities that's going on. And one place we saw the prayer for birth. And I, I, I told my wife, look, this great church that remember us in their prayer. Praise the Lord. And my wife said, something. Amen. God inhabits the praises of his people. When we start worshiping, God comes down. And when God comes down, he begins to shine out of Zion. And souls get under conviction. And people start repenting. And people start getting the Holy Ghost. point in us trying to trying to put on the dog when the visitors come I mean trying to act a little stiff and starchy and dignified they know who we are they've heard about us Let's, we might as well give them a good show give them the money's worth you can't improve on perfection You can be seated. My Lord, amen. Praise God. While I'm talking about that, while I'm talking about that, Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Praise God. Praise God. Y'all going to stay with me? Y'all going to stay with me? Give me while I'm talking about that. Let me tell you what else the Bible says. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Amen. Praise God. Make all the excuses you want. There ain't nothing more beautiful than a man or woman who has surrendered their life to God. He's trying to live according to God's will. He's trying to live right, dress right, talk right, walk right. All this preaching we've been hearing around here this week, I'm going to tell you something. It may not be all there is, but it's a big part of it. God loves holiness. He doesn't want hands lifted in praise full of jewelry. Doesn't want people flashing their flesh while they're trying to worship God. He wants us to worship him in the beauty of holiness. Let me say again what I tried to preach here two years ago. No flesh is going to glory in his presence. Thank God for sanctified folk. Thank God for folks that are trying to walk in the way of righteousness. People that have embraced holiness. You know what the Bible says? For the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. When God saved you, he gave you something Merle Norman can't duplicate. He gave you something Mary Kay can't duplicate. You don't need the eyeshadow, the rouge, and all the color. Just get full of the Holy Ghost. It'll put a blush in your cheeks. It'll put a glow on your face that this world cannot imitate. You cannot improve on perfection. Y'all still with me? Amen. I'm going to try to be real nice. I'm not going to be mean. Amen. I'm not going to be mean. But let me just say this. Some yahoos and Johnny come lately have come along and decided to, amen, that all that stuff isn't important anymore. You can come to church still wear your jewelry, your makeup. Women still bob their hair. Short sleeves, no sleeves. Tank tops, culottes, shorts, low necklines. Uh, amen. So here we go, another clothesline message. Well, just button down, honey. For every pulpit where it's being preached, there are dozens of others where it is no longer allowed. For that reason, we ought to preach it that much louder, that much stronger, because God loves holiness. I know it begins in the heart, but if you've got it in your heart, it'll show up on the outside. Hey Amen. I heard of one church that hired a makeup artist come in and teach their women how to put on makeup. They didn't know after all, it had been years since they'd done it. Poor darlings needed help. They're just getting it all smudged up and they look like, they look like Tammy Faye Baker. Y'all can be seated. Y'all can be seated. You know what that woman had the gall to say? That she felt sorry for little old Pentecostal ladies because she knew that inside every one of them was that little Tammy Faye trying to break out. You got one of those, come up here, we'll cast that devil out of you. God likes this right here. He likes this right here. He likes this right here. Quit being ashamed of yourself. Quit taking the tuck head. Walk through the mall with your head held up high. 
You're a child of the living God, washed in the blood, sanctified by the Spirit. Amen. Praise the Lord. Bring somebody in to teach them, amen, uh, how to do uh, all those cosmopolitan hairdos. Stay in vogue. Amen. Again, I, I'm not trying to just be negative. I'm trying to be positive. You can't improve on perfection. That's positive. You know what I think about when I hear all that kind of stuff? You've got to do something when you no longer have the anointing. But when God is in Zion, when God is in Zion, shining out, shining within, you don't need nothing else. Amen. You can be seated. Let me say something this evening. Uh, I, uh, I, I don't want to... Well, the Bible says this. The precious sons of Zion, comparable to fine gold, how are they esteemed as earthen vessels or earthen pitchers? Amen. God has given us a beauty the world cannot duplicate. You don't go forward when you try to change that. You go backwards. You take away from your beauty. Amen. You know, isn't it, isn't it wonderful that when we walk through the store, before somebody ever knows what we believe, what our doctrine is, they can already see a difference. I know it's only skin deep, but it is a difference. Thank God he's got a different kind of people walking around down here. Let me say this. Because I really do have to hurry. Let me say this. Now, I, might, I might be speaking out of turn. I'm just, I'm kind of an outsider here. Amen. But this PSR convention, amen, has, has developed a reputation down through the years of, of being synonymous with conservative, old-fashioned, gun barrel straight preaching. In fact, that's why I came why a lot of men have come this has become more than just this is again just an outsider's view it's become more than just a west coast meeting there's men here from all over the country there's men here that carry cards and men here that don't carry cards but they have come together with one common purpose and that is a love for this old-fashioned apostolic message God has honored the vision of these good men. Amen. And God has given them a burden and a mandate to prove to modern-day Pentecost that holiness and revival are not only synonymous, but they are the will of God. Because there's many out there saying, if you preach it like this, you can't have revival. And there's others saying that if you're having revival, you must not be preaching anything. God has given this meeting, this conference, a mandate down through the years to prove to the modern day church it not only can be done, it is being done. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. And I know, Brother Walden, amen, there are those men that come around and all they're looking for is rats. You can't please them. They come with a chip on their shoulder. Amen. They're go somebody's going to knock it off. So they're going to see something, find something. Amen. It happens in my church, your church, all of our churches. But there are some men that love this truth. They love holiness. They love this message. And they want to have revival in their church. But I've come to tell you, the day that they come and all they see is fashion on parade, wild hair news, the split skirts we've been hearing about, and all the wild doodads is the day you will neutralize your efficiency and lose your divine mandate. I'm 
probably not qualified to say it, but that's an outsider. Amen. I come a long ways here tonight. Amen. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad for what I see and I'm glad for what I feel. Let's keep it this way. You can't improve on perfection. You can be seated. You can be seated. Amen. So what does it matter anyhow? Praise God. I appreciate what Brother Bass said the first night about evangelists. Amen. They have been instructed in some cases. Thank God there's men that don't feel that way, but been instructed in some cases, amen, not to preach holiness, anything. Leave all that up to the pastor. I'm not talking about meddling in the man's church. Amen. We, we can all cross swords here tonight. We've got differences on everything. That's not what I'm talking about. Amen. But, but God help us the day when a man, amen, stands in our pulpit and he's not at liberty to preach what God gives him in his heart. Oh, yeah. Praise the Lord. I'm going to tell you why all this matters so much this evening. Amen. So well, we're mainly interested in, in uh, having a big move. Well, I'm going to tell you why this is so important. Because the day, amen, that you quit fighting about holiness, you won't defend the truth very long either. That's right. You know, we've been hearing this week about, about Trinitarians and pulpits and all that. It's no surprise to me. We've been flirting with them for years, Being in their, bringing their singing groups on our platforms, letting them sing. It's no wonder there's people in churches all across America that are confused on the apostolic doctrine. As they see their pastors up there calling other preachers in town, amen, that are Trinitarians, brother. Come on now, this makes you nervous. Let me just get nervous. It's in the first time I've been in this position. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you something else. Not only am I not going to bring them on my platform, I have no desire to go hear them. Wherever they are. That has been an open door of access by the... By the powers of hell to our people for years you know why because they go there and they sit there and they I just like their music yeah and they sit there right next to somebody going like this loving Jesus and they hear those people get up and ridicule Pentecost and make fun of old-fashioned holiness and they come back confused We don't need to borrow their music know-how. we got enough good music of our own. I'd rather hear a quartet that can't sing on tune very well, but sing with the anointing and inspiration, than I'd rather hear some professional cigarette-sucking somebody put on a performance in the name of Christ. Oh, my God. Amen. Forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. I'd like to challenge every Pentecostal songwriter. Quit writing songs that are just commercially viable. Quit writing songs that are so generic they can be sung by anybody. Start writing some songs based on Acts 238. One God, Jesus name, baptism, and living a holy, separated life to God. Hallelujah. You can be seated. This, this uh, article that's been much referred to this year, Charisma article, it was a slap in the face of all Pentecostals. Oh, yes, it was. Amen. And we found out. We found out. We're not winning them. They think they're winning us. Amen. We're not winning them when we go to their prayer breakfast. And all the other junk they have, they think they're winning us. And now they're demanding that we apologize for the message we're preaching. 
Well, I've said it before. I'm going to say it tonight. I am prepared tonight. Hold on now. I am prepared to apologize for preaching that there is one God. As soon as Isaiah does, I got it from him. I am prepared to apologize for preaching that you've got to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost as soon as the Apostle Peter does because I got it from him I am prepared to apologize for holiness righteousness and separated living as soon as the Apostle Paul does I got it from him I want you to know we've got the book on our side. Oh my God, I feel the Holy Ghost here tonight. Feel the Holy Ghost here tonight. This may not be very couth. This might offend somebody's dignity. But somebody say, Whoa! Somebody say, Woo! I like it. And I feel like the devil just trembled. Because if you believe that there is one God, thou doest well. The devil also believes and trembles. Oh, my God, i got to hurry. Amen. Let us... No, no. No. Amen. I'm, I'm running up against my time limit now. I've got friends. I've got friends. They're not betting people, but they've almost placed bets that I can't stay within that time. And I'm already losing. I'm already losing. And I don't want to take one minute of time away from the good elder that's coming later tonight. But let me say this from my heart. I mean, let us not become so progressive and forward thinking and expansionistic that we leave behind the simplicity of this gospel. God gives us room and latitude to improve ourselves to hone our skills, to finesse our talents, to get more consecrated, more dedicated, amen, to draw closer to God, to be more used of God. But keep your entrepreneurial, amen, demeanor out of the structure of the church. Amen. The Bible still says this, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation of stone, it is a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, and he that believeth shall not make haste. Ephesians 2 and 20 says we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. 1 Corinthians 3.11, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed of it. I make no apologies for it. I am thankful for it tonight. You can be seated. I have just a few things I want to say before I quit. I'm going to try to say them quickly. Amen. It is time. It is time to blow the trumpet in Zion like it never has before. We are right on the eve of the coming of the Lord. Call it youthful zeal, pinheaded thinking. Call it whatever you want to. Amen. I am passionate about this apostolic message. And I don't take kindly to people coming along trying to tamper with it and change it. Many are already reluctant to make their defense. Even because they might lose some influential church members and 
some big tithe payers. Amen. Oh, God, others are intimidated by uh, each other, by, in some instances, church officials and, and uh, organizational potentates and man-made hierarchy. Amen. Come on now. Lord Jesus, I thank God that there are men here tonight that love this truth. But I've got to tell you, not everybody loves it. Not everybody in America feels the way we do here tonight. Amen. It's one thing to stand in a congregation like this and preach it. It's another to go back in some places when everybody's wanting you to keep your mouth shut and stand up and preach it anyhow. I'm not talking about grinding axes. I'm not talking about airing out personality conflicts and little personal vendettas. I'm not talking about just beating up on one another. Amen. Neither am I talking about affiliation flag waving or stone throwing. I'm talking about preaching the truth and letting the truth draw the lines and then every man to his battle stations. And let's fight for Zion tonight. I said let's fight for Zion tonight. Can I ask a question? Should we be any more fearful than Martin Luther? Was it Martin Luther that tacked his thesis to the door of the Catholic Church? Should we be, amen, any more reluctant than Patrick Henry when he stood in a little church house knowing that it might cost him his life and said, I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death? Should we be any more afraid to see a house divided than Abraham Lincoln was when he took a stand amen, for what he believed in and saw civil war break out but that forged this great nation of ours? Should we be any less solace for our cause than Martin Luther King Jr. was for his? Hey, apostolic preacher, stand behind the pulpit and preach and preach and preach like you never have before. Don't apologize. Don't make excuses. Just preach. Let's lift our hands and love the Lord for just a moment. One last passage of scripture, and I'm going to let you go. Amen. The Bible says this, and I'm so afraid, lest this become the story of some of us. Again, I'm not worried about God's church. I'm worried about whether we stay in it. I, I read where there was a bunch of folks that wrote this lament one day by the rivers of Babylon. There we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof, for there they that carried us away captive required of us a song, and they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning, I do not remember thee. Let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. You know what? Amen. We can be deceived into thinking that what we've got here tonight is just going to last forever. We are so vulnerable to the idea that anything we build and anything we do, amen, is going to last forever. Whether it's the houses we build, buildings we put together, 
organizations or even meetings like this, the only thing that has been guaranteed permanence is this. Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I say once more tonight, you can't improve on perfection. Let's love it, or we're going to lose it, and wonder when it happened. God, I hope that if the Lord tarries ten years from now, PSR is still going just as strong as it is tonight. And we're still hearing what we've heard around here this week. Let's stand, lift our hands, and give the Lord praise tonight. Let's everybody praise the Lord. Thank God you're in the church. Come on, thank God you're in his church. Thank God. Please like, comment, and subscribe.